Tonight, Dr. Kamika Williams Witherspoon, who has a PhD in cultural anthropology, uh, is an associate professor of urban theater and community engagement in the theater department at Temple University. She's the author of Through Smiles and Tears, the history of African-American theater from Kemet to the Americas. Uh, she's also the author of The Secret Messages in African-American Theater, Hidden Meaning Embedded in Public Discourse. Um, these are two of her books. Uh, she's written many articles as well. She is a recipient of the 2013 Associate Provost Arts Grant, uh, the 2008 Seed Grant, the 2003 Provost Arts Grant, and 2001 the Independence Foundation Grant the 2000 P, uh, Pew Fellowship, and 1999, the Daimler Chrysler uh, National Poetry Competition. She's a very uh, accomplished, skilled uh, writer and poet, and uh, you will enjoy her. She's, she's had over 27 plays produced. Can you imagine that? Somebody write 27 plays? Man, that's a lot of writing, that's a lot of work. 27 plays, not just written, produced most recently, Count Down to Boom, 2014 and 2013. Her stage credits include over 20 productions, seven one-woman shows, and she has performed poetry at over 86 national and international venues, including Barnes and Nobles in the UK. Williams Witherspoon is a contributing poet to 26 anthologies. Now what that means, people sometimes don't know what that means. That means 26 editors have decided that she needs to be in their volume of poetry. 26 anthologies. And she's a recipient of a host of awards and citations. She is an outstanding scholar, very creative person. We're delighted to have her at the Malefic Kete, Kete Asante Institute. Welcome to my friend, Dr. Kamika Williams Witherspoon. Hotep. Hotep. Greetings and thank you to the Malefe Kete Inst uh, Inst Asante Institute for having me here. Um, as a think tank, um, I'm very privileged to, to come and talk to you about arts and culture because one of the things that we know that when we're talking about the liberation of our people, we cannot forget what arts brings to the table as a mechanism for re resistance. And so I, I wa was very thrilled to be asked to do this. Um, at first, I, I have to be honest, um, I was um, thinking that perhaps, I'm going to flip it around just so I can turn it when I need to. Um, I was thinking that perhaps I might use this as an opportunity to revisit some of my earlier work on African American theater. Um, but then when you start, of course, you get excited about what you're doing, which means, I guess, that I'm in the right field because I still get excited about it. And what it, it worked out to be is um, a development of criteria for which we can begin to critique both classic pieces of African American theater in the canon as well as contemporary theater. Because what troubles me the most is um, when these plays go up, like The Meeting, if you haven't seen it, please do. It is a tremendous piece. Um, when those pieces of African American theater um, hit the stage, too often the press will send white critics who are trained in a Western notion of theater history and performance to critique our work. And most often they do not have the basis or the criteria for which to do that assessment. And so what, I, what, what began as a, a review of what I've, I've been talking about uh, developed into a, a, a development of criteria and perhaps a rubric um, for uh, deconstruction of African American theater. So I'd like to begin. Um, by way of introduction, African American drama utilizes performance traditions gleaned from first world African retentions that are seldom privileged in Western theater history. 
If indeed classic and contemporary examples of African-American theater can be viewed as ethnographies that perform, according to Victor Turner, then to contribute to the canon of African-American theater discourse, this paper contextualizes the history of African-American theater from Kemet, Kemetic Osirian ritual drama to the Americas and offers a detailed rubric for African-American theater criticism. Arguing that any critique of AANT, uh, African American Theater interchangeably, must rely on an African centered contextualization of ritual drama and performance that spans the breadth of diasporan theater traditions. This paper adds to the body of literature to theater history and cultural studies. From comedical Syrian ritual drama, Central African masking traditions and masquerades, West African song fest to the transmutation of music, dance, and narrative storytelling in the Americas. This work further identifies and contextualizes the African elements in African American theater, highlighting the links between some of those African rituals that appear in both classic and contemporary pieces of African American drama even today. So let's talk a little bit about Egypt, if we can. One of the African ritual traditions that has not been as privileged in the historical record is the Memphite dramas of antiquity and the festival reenactments dramatizing the birth and death of Osiris, so-called Osirian ritual drama. The Egyptian book of the, uh, entitled The Coming Forth by Day, and called the Book of the Dead in the West, contains some of the earliest extant examples of public discourse and performance text, according to Dr. Malefi Asante. Dismissing these texts as mere ritual, rather than as theater, would be at best counter-historical and at the very least ethnocentric. By reviewing the data, this paper uh, seeks to shed new light on the contributions of ancient Kemet to theater discourse while critically evaluating the linguistic and hegemonic practices in the development and maintenance of Western discourse that has continually colored Egypt's place as a founding site for the development of theater in the historical record. Osirian ritual drama. <coughs> Egyptian culture was reputedly African. Well, we all know this, but they tell us that it couldn't be true. In 1966, Basil Davison wrote, what these early Egyptians looked like, no one knows, but they doubtlessly preserved certain characteristics of the peoples of the Sahara, end quote. Well, those of us who have traveled to Egypt and visited Karnak, um, one only had to look up, uh, look up at the extant images at the top of temple walls and columns colored by Egyptians themselves to know exactly what these originally African peoples looked like because they painted themselves dark brown skinned. Wallace Budge suggests that Osiris was African though not necessarily Nilotic. Archaeologist Abby Emile Emin Lu, 1850 to 1916, is credited with having found the tomb of Osiris in, at Abydos. Beyond the myth of Osiris, his sister consort Isis and their jealous stepbrother Set, it is now widely believed that Osiris was indeed a historical figure, elevated to God status and revered as far west as Libya throughout Egypt, south to the Sudan, and as far north as Saudi Arabia millennia before the Suez Canal would be widened to separate it from North Africa. Osirian ritual drama regularly reenacted mythology surrounding their quintessential heroic mythical figure, Osiris. There are many parallelisms between the myths of Osiris and what would develop into Christian dogma. How many of us are aware of the Osirian rituals? Yes, yes, okay, for those who perhaps have not have heard of it before, uh, Osiris, the god king, um, was tricked and, and, and uh, into laying down a sarcophagus at the return uh, to his homeland after traveling for many years, uh, uniting uh, the African peoples under his rule, and his jealous brother Set uh, would have him murdered. Um, to further the intrigue and the treachery uh, of this coup d'etat, he would have his body dismembered uh, into seven pieces and then scattered uh, throughout uh, Upper Egypt. His wife and sister consort Isis would um, find the pieces 
and resurrect them uh, using both her mythical or and mystical powers. And then in the first Immaculate Conception, uh, she would be impregnated by his seed and give birth to the, his son Horus. Horus would grow up um, after several years and eventually avenge his father uh, by besting his uncle Set and reuniting the kingdoms. Um, one, according to Sheikh Anta Job, there are many parallels, parallelisms between the myths of, Os of Osiris and what would develop into Christian dogma. According to Job, one needs only to meditate on, Os on Osiris, the redeemer god, who sacrifices himself, dies, and is resurrected to save my mankind as a figure essentially identifiable with Christ, end quote. Deified upon his death, his cult also rivaled the belief in the sun god Ra in terms of geographic influence and sheer numbers of followers. Full of splendor and theatricality, these rituals were melodramas in all of its form and definition, with the action of the play occurring through narration and being controlled by the priest. The coming forth by day offers an ex expression of Egyptian style and rhetoric. Quote, the introductory salutations, according to Malefi Asante, found in the Tet, were intended to connect the present audience to the past, end quote. These introductory salutations provided the necessary exposition and helped to locate the work by calling the liminal boundaries of the world of the play into being. The Osirian cycle dramas were Maatin, con concerned with the triad notions of truth, justice, and harmony. Through these works, as Malefi Asante writes, Mayat becomes a symbol of the search for existential peace. Spectacle and special effects were also an important element of East African theater traditions. Sheikh Anta Job tells us that, quote, the secret of gunpowder was known only to the Egyptian priests who used it solely for religious purposes as rites, such as the mysteries of Osiris, end quote. As part of the theatricality of these performances, a priest representing the demise of Set often killed a live hippopotamus on stage. With this symbolic death, the audience was encouraged to participate in the drama with a large hippopotamus cake would be eaten at the finale, symbolizing the final annihilation of Set. Can you imagine a hippopotamus dying at the end of these um, melodramas, the, the spectacle, the, uh, the sheer weight of the tragedy, and of course the rejoicing that balance had uh, now been restored. The Abydos Passion Plays. A Kernefret, writing perhaps the first recorded performance criticism in the world, wrote in 1860 BCE, uh, before the Common Era, about the spectacle of the Abydos Passion Plays on fragments, which were part of the pyramid text. According to Ekernefret, these performances were spectacles that included burial ceremonies, coronations, and paratheatrical events, such as battles, magnificent river barges, or pageants, like the same ones, or like those that would be replicated um, during the Roman Empire as Ludes and Mamartia. And let me stop there and sort of kibitz. Um, barges would be set on the Nile. Um, the principal players, the pharaoh, the then pharaoh who would play the part of Horus, the priests um, acting as both narrator and playing some of the lesser subnumeries. And then, of course, hippopotamus, or hippopotami, yeah, hippopotami, <laughs> um, as part of the evil villains. And then, of course, the killing of the hippopotam hippopotamus at the end for the tragic effect. Um, when, when the belief in Osiris would be transmutated and then later carried to both Greece and to Rome, those same kind of um, barge performances uh, were performed in the Colosseums of Rome, where they would literally pour in hundreds and hundreds of tons of water, set barges on the, on the, uh, the water, and then uh, fake, or, or not fake, but um, present these th theatricalized versions of battles in much the same way that the Egyptians did with the passion plays. Ikernefret recorded that the Osirian mystery plays were replete with mime and dance, music and song, recitations of great speeches, and audience participation. 
The Abydos Passion Plays were performed annually from 2500 BCE to about 550 BCE, just before the advent of a transmutation of the Osirian cycles on the European continent under the new name of the Festival of Dionysus. According to Gilbert Murray, quote, Dionysus is the connection, was an imitos daemon or vegetation god, like Adonis. Osiris represented the cyclic death and rebirth of the earth and the world, end quote. To the Greeks and Romans as the son of Osiris, the god character Horus would become known in later times as Apollo, uh, and prior to that as Harpocrates, as the god of silence. In that context, he was represented again and again on the European continent as a child with his finger held to his lips. For Osiris was a man given to mirth and jollity and took great pleasure in music and dancing. He therefore carried along with him a train of musicians, of whom nine were virgins, most excellent singers, and expert in many other things. The Greeks would call them muses, of whom Horus, who the Greeks called Apollo, was the captain and was therefore called the leader of the muses. This is Wallace Budge. While the Egyptians failed to construct special venues for their performances, their plays were nevertheless pageant-like, religious, and ritualistic. The Roncinian dramatic papyrus published by Kurt Seath in 1928 is an account of the coronation of Censoret I. Seemingly written by or for the master of ceremony, the piece contains the script of a dialogue written uh, to be spoken by actors representing the various gods. The temple reliefs at Adufu describe the manner of drama performed for the festival of Horus, and prescribing the statue of Hathor had to be carried from her temple at Denera to the festivities of Adufu. The Adufu text contains staging instructions for what apparently were rather large-scale productions with a number of performers, uh, so that uh, Dr. Asante, the meeting and all of the budgetary performances uh, and performers that are attached to it is, is nothing new. It's, right. it's what we always had to have. Uh, and those, uh, uh, those uh, number of performers included the subnumeraries, the props, and the backdrops that needed to be built uh, for the performance. According to Budge, few Africans of any nation fail to incorporate elements of song and dance in their social rituals. Quote, all Nilotic peoples are greatly addicted to dancing, and they never seem able to perform any ceremony without it. Again, Wallace Budge, end quote. Judging from the inference and the research, both the Osirian mysteries and the Abydos passion plays shared elements of narration, music, dance, song, elevated dialogue, and soliloquy. Part opera and part musical theater. Typically, Egyptian drama did not include all of the dynamics of the chorus that would later become synonymous with Greek theater in 5th century BC. There is no evidence that the musicians or nine virgins or muses sang in unison as they did later in 500 BC in Greek theater. But the Egyptian chorus did include symbolic dances and ballets, which formed part of the corpus of their performance. It is said that Oh dear, uh, I, I added this one. Uh, this is, uh, venue, uh, standing venues were not built uh, in Egypt for these performances. Again, many of them were in found spaces on the, the, the banks of the Nile, uh, in temple uh, courtyards. This is a, a, an image of um, a Roman styled theater in Alexandria that was during the Ptolemaic period. I just incorporated it to, to show the, um, the influence that the uh, Romans had on Egypt, on, on Egypt after the colonization and oppression, oppressive period, but that the original theater would have taken place outdoors as part of found spaces. Yes, there we go. Um, it is said that Isis and the Seven Scorpions was a morality play, written in verse and performed with choruses where the gods were anthropomorphized and treated like humans. For all of the Egyptian plays, Abydos and Bosirius, the alleged birthplace of the two deities respectively, were the principal centers of the festiv festivals and its requisite performances. In the, in the Golden Ass, 
circa 155 AD, Lucius Ap Apulius, an African priest of Isis, left an account of the mystery cult that became closely associated with dreams, prophecy, divination, and visions. Additionally, Wallace Budge writes, Apulius saw Queen Isis, queen of heaven, earth, and the underworld, and mother of, the, of wheat, rise with the moon, the symbolic representation of Osiris from the sea. Wallace Budge writes that Isis, to all who seek her help, appears in dreams and gives relief, and some believe still does, does so today. The Memphite uh, dramas celebrated not only the resurrection of Osiris, but also the coronation of Horus as the successor god king. As the reigning kings were said to be reincarnations of Horus as the son of Ray or Amun Ra, or Amun Re, excuse me. These pharaohs or chief kings used the theatricalized performance to claim legitimacy to the throne. It has been suggested in the reenactments of the yearly drama that pharaohs would play the role of Horus in these performances as a way to associate themselves with the legacy of the line of god kings from Osiris and legitimize their claim beyond the Nile Valley. According to Christopher E. Hart, the period of roughly 7,000 to 5,000 BC marked the spread of Erythraic peep, people, the Cushites. By 3500 BC, the spread of the Cushitic societies and cultures extended into all but the southwestern quadrant of Ethiopian highlands, with one branch of these peoples, the southern Cushites, emerging as a distinctive society at the dry, far south of the highlands, where they verged on lowlands north, northern, of, northeast of, excuse me, of Kenya. Christopher E. Hart contends, quote, not only agricultural influences may have passed between these then neighboring sects of societies, end quote. Because of the commercial revolution, new lanes of trade routes were established and maintained. Now, no longer did influence spread only from community to neighboring community, but rather might spread at, in a relatively short span of time across to new and distant areas. With the expansion of the Egyptian empire, the sixth dynasty, 2423 to 2242 BCE, under Pepi I, black Africans from Nubia, Aswan, and Central Africa were regularly conscripted into the army of the nobles in the Egyptian empire before the imposition of colonial, i.e. Syria, or Arab, Arabic, or Greek rule, foreign rule. According to Basil Davison, while under Ramses II, 1292 to 1225 BCE, Egyptian influence would extend for another thousand years into West and Southern Africa. Why is this important? Well, so much of the debate between Afrocentrists and scholars in African-American and diasporan studies centers around the reluctance of one group to embrace the idea that Egypt or ancient Kemet could be the benchmark for early African scholarship, political formation, and culture, and could influence the cultures to its west. Although for several millennia Egypt was the center of so much progress, science, and achievement, other parts of Africa, though admittedly on a smaller scale perhaps, were being influenced by comedic practices in the east and equally thriving and contributing to the fabric of African culture. As for the rest of the African continent, European scholars bound by nationalism and a history of justifying cultural imperialism were so quick to discount other traditional African performance rituals and traditions simply because the civilizations and cultures in many of the, those respective regions um, in which they function were thought to be inconsequential and intellectually impoverished. That tendency to discount North, South, and West African cultural contribution was based almost entirely on erroneous and ethnocentric notions that these African cultures lacked letters to record in central myths, ideals, and aspirations, and that oral history was not valuable history. However, we know that the ancient African cities of Moreau, Kemet, and Abyssinia had very extensive written documentation, according to the work of Dr. Malefi Asante. South of the Sahara, some of the script that was developed that we now know of included the writings of the Ve, which much like hieroglyphics of antiquity, was a pictorial form of writing. Uh, and the Nisibidi, a syllabic script attributed to the secret society of ethic culture, according to Johannes John. 
Whether chiseled on stone, scrawled on papyrus, or parchment, writing became a way of preserving what had once been thought. But writing is not the only way to communicate about a culture's past, nor is it the only way to communicate in a culture's present. In fact, much of the material culture, like rock paintings in the Sahara, offer visual evidence that black Africans were painting themselves in portraiture, in pottery fragments, as early as 3500 BC, 3000 BCE, 2000 BCE, 900 BCE, and as late as AD 200, according to Basil Davison. Material culture found in Ghana proved that here lived a people that were proficient in ironworking as far back as 300 BC, although Davidson suggests that oral tradition takes them vaguely uh, some way farther back. And yet, despite written, physical, and material evidence in the historical record that speaks to the wealth of civilization and culture throughout Africa, even west of the Nile, it must be remembered that African culture is first and foremost an oral culture so that their record of myth, legend, music, dance, and song should be equally as valued and valuable to any historical treatise on the history of African cultural ritual and theater. So let's talk a little bit about West African theater traditions. Griot performers and musicians likewise use drama as a mechanism for institutionalized uh, socialization in their respective communities. The roots of the development of theater in West Africa coincided with a vibrant early trade route economy from the coastal cities across North Africa and sometimes stretching as far inland as the Sudan. Alice Childress wrote, each nation had actors, dancers, and singers who were trained to perform messages from the past, end quote. West African theater was predominantly an oral tradition and griot storytelling or narrative was an integral component thereof. Some West African dramas included recognized traditions of masquerade with requisite attention to spectacle and costuming and fancy dress. The use of mask, dancing, communication, and the drum, of course, along with singing. Robert Graves wrote that true myth through a process of intellectual reductionalism could be de defined as a kind of narrative shorthand of ritual mime. Any take in the narrative or oral tradition that involves play and creativity can then be called a myth. And according to Harold Schwab, Schweb, Schwab, hmm, Schwab, <laughs> this also includes the wealth and breadth of African storytelling traditions. According to Schwab, Mm. Although African mythology differs widely by region, culture, and language family, most African myths are masked themselves, both revealing and concealing. In African culture, then, the griot, or myth maker, like the thespian in Western tradition, is the consummate commentator both on and for his community. Once the myth is acted out or performed, that cultural product consistently reenacted continually contributes to the discourse and language of African arts production. Henry Louis Gates, and I know Dr. Asante hates when I use him, but Henry Louis Gates, <laughs> you got me at the joke, you did, so it's okay. Henry Louis Gates writes that, quote, through the mask, a code of meanings is established through the media of rhythm, movement, and tonal specific harmonies that affects the spiritual consolidation of the race, end quote. So now, injected into this discourse, we have to talk about the stealing of bodies and cultures. In 1441, Anton Concaves, a Portuguese sailor, kidnapped 10 Africans near Cape Bojada, beginning what would later become known as the start of the Atlantic slave trade. In 1482, the Portuguese built Fort Elmina as a trading facility on the Gold Coast. The Portuguese would subsequently follow Fort Elmina with a series of other forts for the express purpose of trading in material goods and human cargo. By 1662, John Hawkins would become the first English slave trader capturing and kidnapping 300 slaves from Sierra Leone. By the 17th century, the Dutch, the Brits, and the Danish would likewise follow with a string of other forts that would begin to build on the economy of the slave trade. By the 1672, the British Royal Africa Company would establish a precedent transporting an average of 5,000 slaves a year. 
Ghana and Lagos in Nigeria would become one of the first West African nations as a consequence of the slave trade that would develop into a hybrid culture in and around the forts, particularly in the area around what is now Ghana. By the 19th century, Britain had capitalized on an import-export relationship with Africa that profited on the exportation of crops introduced to the ecology specifically for European consumption, while maintaining the importation of British textiles, rum, and, honor, and iron excuse me, uh, for human slaves. That level of long-term and involved interdependence ne necessitated the emergence of colonial administrators and an emerging new class hierarchy in African culture. According to Corinne Barber, quote, colonialism then accelerated the formation of new classes, end quote. It was from that obscured and more socially political fluid intermediate class that modern African popular cultural theater traditions would emerge. The range of colonial impact depended upon the length and saturation of any given region's history of colonial oppression. Between North, West, East, and South Africa, West African theater probably retained much more of its tr traditional elements and ritual aspects, even through colonization, because colonial populations were less saturated in those regions. The geographic terrain and climate of West Africa made it impossible for the colonizers to project an extensive stay. The inhospitable, hazardous, mosquito-infected tropical rainforest of the region, according to Yuba, made the possibility of extended stays impossible and improbable for most Europeans to bear. Quote, the colonial period in West Africa saw the creation of a new kind of theater, a popular, modern, commercial, traveling, musical theater of sorts that would later be dubbed concert party theater. Karen, Karen Berber, end quote. By the colonial period in West Africa, those internet uh, theatrical traditions of old readily mingled with imported cultural creations on the Gold Coast of Africa, resulting in an innovative fusion and a new kind of African theater. Quote, unlike the oral performances and masquerade theaters of tradition, according to Karen, Karen Ber Berber, colonial and post-colonial West African theater introduced the idea of paying money for artistic production and a thematic shift was made in subject matter and plot away from ancestral reference and mythology to preoccupations with modernity, money, the city, gender relations, and how to live a good life in a changed world." End quote. In the British colonies, as a decidedly modern West African popular culture emerged, newly ascribed definitions of theater were a product of it. This resulting West African theater capitalized on traveling comic operas, slapstick, musical comedies, and song fest. That takes us then to African American theater in the Americas, circa 1600 to 1829. When that Portuguese sailor kidnapped 10 Africans in 1441, that one act led to one of the most infamous periods of human holocaust that is rarely and almost always begrudgingly remembered in the annals of, a, of the history of humanity. From 1619, when the first Africans were sold into slavery in Jamestown, Virginia, to the recognized end of the legal slave trade in the US in 1808, although illegal slave trade continued clandestinely until the 1830s. Whether by raid or trickery, more than 100,000 Africans were forcibly torn from the bosom, excuse me, 100 million Africans were forcibly torn from the bosom of their African homes, according to Johannes John and Richard Wright. Some scholars place the number of Africans killed or dislocated as a direct result of the African slave trade much higher. According to Sheikh Anta Jope, quote, it has been estimated that the slave trade swallowed up 100 to 300 million individuals, dead, or shipped to America, end quote. To maintain a pathological justification for the enslavement of Africans, quote, in the earliest instances, perception of the Negro was shaped by a naive, exotic science fiction reductivism, end quote, Lemuel Johnson. To color and give voice to their own representations, these newly transplanted Africans began dramatizing their own experiences, but because of the overt racism of the time, those dramatizations usually utilized a hidden transcript through the use of coded language, double entendre, mask, and irony. 
According to anthropologist Richard Anderson, quote, art plays an overt role in human activities, end quote. And as Karl Marx and Frederick Engels would say, art is a contributor and a product of social consciousness. In African American culture, AANT has historically functioned as a site of resistance and as a medium to publicize social political concerns such as racial disparities, linguistic hegemony, social cultural injustice, power relations, and class struggles. Language, words, and no more. Because of, and, and at times in spite of the enslavement process, the experiences of African Americans has, has always been, or have always been, inherently dramatic. Zora Neale Hurston says, African American dr de drama developed like so many other ritual traditions as a medium through which a few select entertainers and theater practitioners gave voice to their social consequences and med me meditations and mediations of difference. Through stylized use of features in African American vernacular English, so called ebonics, from its earliest beginnings, AANT used its drama as a means to question ideologies of race, class, and gender, sometimes by ironically underscoring those issues through exaggerated performances, and other times by promoting consideration through the irony of its omission. Every colonized people, according to Franz Fanon, whose soul and inferiority complex has been created by the death and burial of its local cultural originality, finds itself face to face with the language of the civilizing nation. Incorporating extra African references, the kidnapped Africans now um, made slaves, began to learn their new languages in the same manner as they spoke West African and Central African dialects, according to uh, Leroy Jones, um, AKA Amir Baraka. Those dialects informed the way those African slaves prescribed meaning to their experience and counter insurgencies in the new world. Understanding the development of Ebonic speech behavior is critical to understanding the situational patterns of speech in the development of ritual traditions in AANT that would both stimulate linguistic and cultural competence. Acknowledging African retentions in early African American communication strategies must also include iconographic language dynamics at work in the motif of tactile craft, carvings, polyrhythmic tonal languages of drums, bones, and banjos, along with the narrative texts so often embedded in music and dance. According to Leroy Jones, um, these extra African references survived in America in their totality, although usually given just a thin veneer of Euro-American camouflage. For many of the African slaves, particularly those in the colonies uh, to the north, they retained enough of a rich history and tradition of music and dance to participate in collective dances and impromptu gatherings. Language strategies became the first defense against depersonalization as to speak, according to Franz Fanon, means to claim a culture. Africans, now Americans by default, would work to find artistic modes of expression that would either benignly escape colonial attention or at the very least, not incur its wrath as, according to Fanon, a man who has language consequently possesses the world expressed and implied by that language, end quote. So from language to song. Language serves a social function that contributes to the construction of identity, ritual traditions, and the public transcript. In this way, the poor sang one tune when they were in the presence of the rich and another tune when they were among themselves. This multi-layered view of language use, social interaction, and the construction of meaning tied to time and space provides a culture with the necessary mechanisms to use their art to educate and activate collective social consciousness. Resistance to linguistic hegemony was also problematized by gender. Resistance in the Americas was often expressed through language and song. Pointing to a West African retention where women's labor becomes infused with song as a way of regimenting labor intensive tasks and maximizing efficiency. Here in the Americas, Barbara Bush suggests that language and song were likewise mutually inclusive and interdependent. Quote, through song, work could be rendered less burdensome, slave morale could be raised, and white masters mimicked, satirized, or even subtly threatened. Song and music accompanied all the important events in a slave's life, end quote. 
through the tonal and metaphoric scripts of music and dance. It is usually in those mediums where Africanisms or cultural retention still recall the curious mixture that distinguishes the people. In that restrictive artistic climate, field songs, gospels, the banjo, and playing the bones became ready art forms. African in nature, nature, according to Caribbean scholar Barbara Bush, songs were built on statement and choral response patterns, so much a part of African call and response traditions in the celebratory masquerades of West Africa. Quote, African music has always two or three, sometimes as many as four, competing elements for call and response, according to W.E. Ward. And because of their vocal range and power, women so often took the lead parts in these plantation songs. Quote, in the fields, women sang songs of their own composing, which were answered in the same manner by men, end quote. Women were the predominant voices in slave songs on plantations across the nation, with the exception of work and digging songs, which were the province of men. Musicality. In slave quarters across the Americas after sundown, Christmas holidays, and during Sunday free time, plantation slaves regularly enjoyed singing, dancing, and telling stories. Holidays became infectiously theatrical when slaves assembled together in alarming crowds for purposes of dancing, feasting, or merriment, rabbit tube. Western art critics who seemingly knew and figured the potential hidden transcript and function of African-American music and theater would find so much of African-American cultural arts production alarming, and they would write about it consistently. Beyond the benign public transcript of dancing and merriment as a function of the hidden transcript, African-American folk beliefs and practices provided hope, assurance, and a sense of group identification, according to Lawrence Levine. In slave quarters and small circles of friends and family, displaced Africans and first-generation African-Americans found space for expression in their folk tales, in their dress, in their language, in their song, and in their spirituality. A quote, although slaves had little time for amusement, Plays were highly popular combining verbal dexterity, music, and dance, end quote, Barbara Bush. There was a wealth of artistic, comedic, and cultural talent that could be found in the slave quarters in almost every plantation in the South, south of Canada, according to Malcolm X. According to James Haskins, every plantation of any size had its talented slave dancers, comedians, and musicians who played the banjo a genuine black instrument brought over from Africa that Thomas Jefferson would even write about in his journals in 1784. On the continent, Africans had developed a drum language to communicate information across regional cultures and to large numbers of people, according to Johannes John. Many African languages had a, music, a musical quality, uh, John wrote, and drum script was taught at an early age and used as a tonal telegraph. Although drumming was recognized by enslavers as an integral part of the African system of communication and therefore banned its use on most plantations because the drum had been used to count down to the Stono Rebellion in 1739. But the implementation of basic African rhythms in America began to mutate into the hand clapping, body patting, and the foot stomping, drum beating rhythms that were imported to the colonies from Africa as well. The only musical instrument we had, and this is, I'm sorry, this is a quote. The only musical instrument we had was a jug or a big bottle, a skillet lid or a frying pan that they'd hit with a stick or a bone. We had a flute too, made out of reed cane, and it made good music. Freed slave Bob Maynard recalled in his slave narrative from Bullwhip days. Other percussion sounds were made from bells on ankles, bamboo tubes struck one upon another, jawbones from animals whose dried teeth would rattle and create a sound similar to today's marimbas, and of course, the crudely crafted triangle bells. Plantation musicians learned to play bugle, gourd, fiddles, and de clapping bones made out of reef, beef ribs, Charlie Williams remembered in the Oklahoma slave narratives. British actress Fanny Kimball wrote in 1838 in her famous journal of life on a Georgia plantation that the slaves, quote, always seemed to keep exquisite time and tune with their bodies and their instruments, end quote. Dance with music. Yes. Ring shouts identified with African religious and cultural origins for the most part were strictly forbidden. Play parties, also known as Josie parties, 
were designed around ring dances as games, as a way to slip past or around those self-defined social monitors and religious proselytes that believed that dancing was evil. In these gatherings, quote, singers provided music for both men and women who moved around in circles or rings, according to Baker. These games, like musical chairs, developed out of that tradition. Theatrical by design, many of these ecstatic performances were guided by a fluid test. As examples of early ANT, these performances observed the dictates of a well-made play in some identifiable form, complete with a beginning, middle, and an end. There was theater, there was music, there was dialogue, there was also oftentimes um, of the interplay of diction, plot, character, and of course, spectacle, much like uh, is attributed to Aristotle or Greek inventions alone, but we know that the Africans brought them with them to the Americas. Early AANT performances acted as an outline for improvisation or uh, a spectacle and the extemporaneousness of the magic of actor-audience interaction, that kinetic transference of energy where I give you energy, you give me energy back, and that becomes the performance, the world of the play. Likened to the Commedia dell'arte of Renaissance Italy in the 16th and 17th century, these elastic performances were built on choral improvisation, call and response motifs, so much a part of African traditions. Some slave musicians were perceived so valuable, in fact, that uh, when three uh, disappeared in Louisville in 1845, 1844, excuse me, they were advertised in posters as being worth $1,500 apiece. When the three music makers headed north, several thousand dollars were expended in efforts to trace their whereabouts and to get them back, attesting to the beginnings of a reluctant appreciation for African-American music, dance, and drama. In 1791, a Negro troupe of comedians and entertainers gave performances in New Orleans under the direction of Louis Tabere. There are records of other semi-professional bands of blacks that probably toured a few southern plantations and towns, but there couldn't have been very many because, as we know, most African Americans were slaves and not free to travel during this time. And yet, we must not forget that as early as 1821, the African Grove Theater in Manhattan's Greenwich Village was founded by the retired ship steward Henry Brown Brown, who himself was a West Indian owner of a Bleecker Street ice cream parlor, wrote plays himself and encouraged the development of what would become African-American drama. In his ice cream parlor with its adjacent garden, the African Grove Theater would become the first professional black theater in America, giving early training to actors such as James Hewlett from Queens and Ira Aldridge, who had been educated at the African Free School. In 1822, one year after its opening, the Grove Theater would be forcibly closed by police following a disturbance caused by rowdy white residents of the city, angered that the Grove Theater had dared to mount Shakespeare's Richard III. In the 1870s and 80s, the Fisk and Hamilton and Hampton Jubilee Singers raised money for their schools by singing the spirituals and Negro songs that had been so influ influential in American popular culture. According to black scholar Ann Charters, the Fisk players raised $150,000 singing the songs that meant so much to the African American community. Reputedly the most famous of all slave musicians, was the Georgia-born child prodigy, Blind Tom. Thomas Green Bethune, 1849 to 1908, was an early composer and musician. Thomas Green, Blind Tom, was said to have been able to play by ear any musical composition that he'd ever heard without a flaw only after, after hearing it only one time. His master, Colonel Bethune, made the young man into a national attraction, and even long after emancipation, according to Ellen Southern, Tom's concert career continued. Like Blind Tom, other African-American musicians who developed their talents despite racial oppression became minstrel men during post-war freedom, but only as individual performers. These performers were not welcomed into the developing minstrelsy as early white-only minstrel companies felt justified in imitating or co-opting black ta talent yet would not permit Negroes, the prevailing ter term at the time, onto the stage. However, carnivals and traveling medicine shows did employ the talents of so-called gifted colored performers. 
Their inherent artistic talent provided the cultural matrix for what was to evolve into the early beginnings of African American theater. And I'm winding, I promise. So here we have some retentions in African American theater. As we have discussed then, beginning with Osirian ritual drama in ancient Kemet, through to the development of storytelling and cultural performance in, in Libya, through to the Sudan, South Africa, and then parts of Ghana and Nigeria in West Africa. These performances combined the elements of narration, call and response, musicality, and movement. Each regional performance history usually incorporated storytelling, narrative sequencing with an, an identifiable beginning, middle, and end, or a BME, as well as male and female singers, dance, in West Africa and the use of the drum. In Kemet, the annual cycle dramas were Maatian, as I mentioned, concerned with the necessary triangulation of truth, justice, and harmony, with a priest filling the role as the narrator and the ruler Pharaoh playing the role of Horus, the avenging son, we can only assume the priest and devotees played the part of the other principal characters, notably Isis, while the antagonist role was often personified by the living hippotamus. Um, Herodotus writes of Libya. Oh, no, didn't put it in there, sorry. <laughs> Forget that one. Uh, Herodotus writes of Libyan performance. Beginning on the side of Egypt, the first Libyans are the Adramadachi. Ad These people have, in most points, the same customs as the Egyptians, but use the, custom, the costume of the Libyans. Herodotus accounts of the Libyans hints to why they were believed to be a race of warrior women who reenacted mock battles each year, where a virgin maiden was made to dress in armor and mount a chariot to lead the procession. And then there's a very long quote where it talks about the uh, choreographed fight battles uh, uh, that Herodotus uh, mentions in book four of his histories. In Libya, these annual performances were filled with parades, pageantry, athletic competition, and choreographed fight sequences. Beyond the Nile Valley, south of the Sudan, and in West Africa, griots, dancers, singers, and drum language develops. West African dramas included recognized traditions of masquerade with requisite attention to spectacle and costuming with fancy dress, mass, dancing, drum, and of course, singing, which takes us to the African performance traditions so that you have the Osirian drama traditions, the Libyan traditions, and then the West African traditions side by side so that you can see how they correlate. Whether privileging them as ritual or theater, these performances became social meta commentaries on their societies, regardless of their plots, nor whether they were drawn from myths or reputed historical accounts. As a story a group tells itself about itself, these performances constituted the beginnings of early African American theater. African American theater then has developed manifold strategies to insinuate resistance, even in disguised forms, into the public transcript. Many of those disguised forms operate as deep structured survivals or African retentions. Those retentions have historically informed African American drama and through their continued existence, despite acculturation and melting pot theories that place more value on Western contributions, they exemplify counter hegemonic strategies in African American arts production. In Sterling Plump's work on black rituals, he identifies a host of rituals readily enacted now in African-American performance and social drama. Plump's analysis touches on everything from faith-based rituals and plays like Langston Hughes' Black Nativity, not from 1961, to Walter Dallas's Lazarus Unstoned in 2004, to the gendered rituals of Home and Hearth and Angelina Grimke's Rachel from 19, 1916, or Lorraine Hansberry's A Raisin in the Sun, 1959, to black male rituals of gambling and fighting in Charles Fuller's A Soldier Story, 1984, or into Zaki Shange's Sparkle, 2002. Some of the most popular rituals in ANT include the following. Women's rituals like the kitchen, the so replicating sewing or cleaning, um, childbirth as a ritual, beauty shops, and we know of course those are all oftentimes comedic, uh, and then the mother-daughter talks. Of the gendered male rituals that we often get in these pieces or extant pieces of African-American theatrical canon, there's often gambling, uh, replicated fighting, athletics, barbershop antics, 
um, the use of manual labor, oftentimes gardening and um, or playing with cars, incarceration or jail time rituals are replicated on the stage, and then of course pool rooms. You can't have a play about black man, men unless you add a pool table. And then <laughs> some of the collective rituals that you might see replicated again and, and again on the African American stage. Rites of passage, i.e. birth, marriage, birthdays, and first, death rituals, church, recreation, and chorus. And when we talk about first, you know, the first haircut, uh, that's always good for a lot of laughs, oftentimes, the fir laughs and or uh, dr uh, trauma. Uh, first car uh, with male rituals, first love affair, first sexual obsession as male rituals, and then the first long dress or evening gown that young girls get uh, the, um, the first sexual encounter period, uh, although sex is very often, or, or excuse me, is very seldom uh, put on the African-American stage um, because they, some would say it's because we don't want to replicate notions of the, the buck from the Toms, Coons, Mulattoes, Mammies, and Bucks by Donald Bogle. First jobs, and then of course female rituals like first menses. Um, so, uh, and this following is, a tra is uh, traditions or other traditions in African American theater. So that you get active rituals like doing the hair or the replicating the, using the straightening comb as a ritual, stuffing a bra, you know, uh, for the men, you, nobody you know ever did that, but some folks did put tissue in their bras. Um, <laughs> shopping is replicated again and again, counting money. Uh, folding clothes or ironing is often a gender ritual that you will see many times on the stage uh, for African-American women. Uh, folding clothes, friends, uh, the girlfriends or the several friends coming together, favorites, you know, oh, this is my favorite uh, perfume, those kinds of things. Fortune is uh, to oftentimes gambling. Uh, the foes, or the, there's always the, the enemy or the bullying um, scene that's replicated. Faking, fun, and fathers are several um, of the rituals that Plump talks about in his work. Of the linguistic rituals, playing the dozens is one that's often replicated. Wait, your mama's so fat, you know, those kind of jokes. Um, greetings, um, you, you start to see this a lot more, especially uh, from plays from the 60s and the 70s where they would come and, and do the handshake, but it'd be, it would be very exaggerated, so that there'd be like 12 minutes worth of, you know, you know. Um, so that, that's often replicated on the stage. Praying is one of the, the religious or spiritual rituals that you often find, um, in, as particularly in our musicals. Uh, so it's usually an older, uh, uh, female character, um, but you know her ability to pray and to pray away the the evil or to pray up the good is um, is one that playwrights return to again and again. Gossip is another one of the linguistic rit rituals where we're talking about or the characters are talking about something that happened as a way of giving the audience members ex exposition, but also just sort of replicating this this. Uh, this very African cultural uh, um, item that we, we use again and again. Funerals. You almost can't find a, a black play that doesn't have at least one funeral in it because you know, that it allows um, uh, playwrights to bring in the, um, the importance of the spirituality in the black community, um, but it also allows for uh, the gospel musical uh, rendition that usually takes people over the edge and adds to catharsis. Um, uh, we have rap is now being replicated again and again, and particularly in contemporary um, um, examples of African American theater. Uh, there are um, rap op operas that are being um, written and performed on stage. Uh, the telephone uh, was a ritual that was used uh, in the uh, 1950s through to the 1970s. It was a way of ritualizing technology. Um, and now we're so tied to uh, the internet, we're starting to see uh, plays where the text from from texting or on a computer are, are shown on the uh, backdrop of the stage as a way of sort of, uh, uh, of of bringing this discussion of technology and how it's in, imposed itself in the African American community in our place today. Uh, Ebonics, of course, we've talked about the use of our language because we're writing to and for our people. Folk tales, 
metaphors, call and response, proverbs, personal narratives where you'll have, um, you know, very intense monologues uh, like uh, you get from for color girls who consider suicide when the rainbow is enough, and then, of course, mythology or myth uh, of the movement rituals. Um, and these lend themselves to uh, dance sequences, but there's often uh, contemporary dances, you know, you, where you know what setting you are based on what dance they're doing. So if I'm, if you see characters doing this, you're pretty much sure it's, you know, it's the late 60s, early 70s, because they're doing the twist. Um, gambling, uh, again, the rituals are often set to, they're, um, they're not set to music. They can appear just as, um, as a, a, a prologue of sorts to particular scenes where you'll see men sort of gambling on the side of the street and, and literally just doing the movements to take you to a place in time or to create an image of, of black manhood in the community. Praying and shouting, we've talked about the fighting. Uh, oftentimes these are choreographed sequences, but, uh, and particularly when you talk about the incarceration rituals or you know, scenes, uh, fighting becomes a very important component of those movement rituals. Funerals again, Funerals allow for the dirge dance, you know, the way we walk around the casket, the crying, someone always falls out at a funeral and that's replicated on the stage. Parties, um, uh, you know, again, in, in, during the Black Arts Movement or BAM, you would find a great many of those plays that would incorporate a small party scene to give people an opportunity um, to feel a kinship to what they were watching. Uh, the amusements and then finally games for children. Um, I think, so critiquing African-American theater with respect to the history uh, of African performance traditions and the importance of the development of African-American theater as social drama. A rubric for African-American criticism then should include a critique of African-American ritual critique elements or ARC. Uh, that might include music, storytelling, character delineation, the kinetic transference of energy, audience participation, call and response, the use of aesthetic distance, movement, dance, and linguistic elements, which includes ebonics use and genres of communication, myths, folk tales, parables, um, simile, metaphor, and the dozens. And so I've given you that table as well. Um, and then, winding honestly, <laughs> Honestly, as my conclusion, African American drama utilizes performance traditions gleaned from first world African retentions, regardless and however shaped by American experiences, and demands the same seriousness of attention as other cultures' social rituals. African American drama can be critiqued as ethnographies that performed, as Victor Turner tells us. But that critique must rely on an African-centered contextualization of ritual drama and performance traditions that spans the breadth of diasporan theater traditions from comedic Osirian ritual drama to Central African masking traditions and masquerades to West African song fest to the transmutation of music, dance, and narrative storytelling in the Americas. Hopefully, this paper adds to that body of literature by contextualizing the African elements in African-American theater and highlighting the links between some of those African rituals that appear in both classic and contemporary pieces of African-American drama even today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.